Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's Rabbi Akiva Mails, and today is Wednesday. It is May 26th, and we're getting ready for Parshas Bahaloscha. And I've got some items I wanted to share on the Parsha this week that I hope you'll find interesting, I hope you'll find enjoyable. I've got it up on the screen in case anyone uh, didn't uh, print out the, the handout that went out in the email. We've got it here on the screen. Bahaloscha is an amazing Parsha. There is so much material, it really all over the place. There's so many different items that come up in this Parsha. It's impossible to do a full survey of the Parsha in the amount of time that we have, but it's just really, I urge everyone, take time over Shabbos or before Shabbos, look at the Parsha, you'll see it's just amazing how many different themes come up in the course of this one Parsha. So this morning I wanna focus on two themes with you. The first one that we're gonna look at here has to do with Birchas Kohanim, the special blessings that the Kohanim, that the priests, the, the male descendants of Aharon, of Aaron, the first Kohen Godot, what is their bracha, their blessing that they share with the community? Now, in, let's first read the psukim. We'll talk a little bit about when this takes place. So this is in Parshas Bahaloscha. It's in the end of Perak Vav, chapter six. So here are the six psukim, the six verses where you'll find this information. So Hashem speaks to Moshe and he says, I want you to speak to Aaron and his children saying, this is how I want you to bless the Jewish uh, people. This is what I'd like you to say to them. So he uh, says that, you know, Hashem should uh, bless you and watch over you. Hashem should cause his countenance to shine on you and to favor you. Shalom. And then he should also have his countenance raise it towards you and grant you peace. And lastly, and I want you to bestow my name upon the children of Israel so that I will bless them. So before I go any further, just a brief correction. Uh, I, I made one mistake. This Birchas Kohanim, I'm including it this week because there's something I just have to share with you. But that's actually in the Parsha we read this last Shabbos, Naso. So the first half of what we're going to look at today is from Naso, and the second half is Baloscha. So again, Birchas Kohanim, this first part that we're about to share and we're going to learn together, this is in what we read this last Shabbos in, in, uh, in Naso, not what we're going to be reading in Baloscha now. But nonetheless, I want to share this with you because it's, it's so nice. I can't let this get away. So this is the blessing of the Kohanim, the Birchas Kohanim. In Israel, this is recited daily. That's the minog, that's the custom in, in Israel. And that's according to the Torah law, that really should be recited daily. And in Israel, they still do it that way. Uh, it, it, if anyone's visited Israel and taken part in the Shachris there, even during the weekday, this takes place. If you've just been to Shachris on Shabbos, you'll see it, it's, uh, it's on Shabbos every, every week as well. And it's special. It's something that uh, I know that whenever I visit Israel, Whenever I'm there with Layla, we enjoy this because this is something here in the Chutzlar, it's in the diaspora outside of Israel, we experience on far fewer occasions. We'll get to that in a minute. But the Torah says that the Kohanim are supposed to bless the Jewish people. And here are the Psukim. These are the brachos are spelled out for us what it is that they're supposed to say. In Chutzlar, it's outside the land of Israel. Uh, we say this far less often. It's really just recited on the Yom Tovim. And the Yom Tovim is the only time where we experience Birchas Kohanim. Again, in the Chazar Sashats, when the, the Chazan repeats the Shemon Esrei every morning at Shachris on a regular weekday, the Chazan does this. He'll, this will be part of the, uh, the Chazar Sashats, but, but it is not something where we actually have Kohanim go up there and stretch out their hands and bless us. That outside the land of Israel, we, in Ashkenazic communities, we only experience that on the Yom Tovim. And that has raised an incredible amount of discussion. Svarim have been speaking about this for hundreds of years. How did this develop? And a lot of it is, is really, uh, um, I would say, clouded in mystery. It's not 100% clear how that developed, that outside the land of Israel, we don't uh, have Birchas Kohanim as often as they do in Israel. There are a lot of theories that are out there. 
But just to be clear, it's something that has raised question marks. Uh, in fact, it's very well known that the Vilna Gon tried to reinstitute it outside the land of Israel in the in Chutz Laretz. He was not successful. His Talmud of Chaim Velazhner also tried to reinstitute it, was not successful. Uh, many sources, Ashkenazic, say it's almost like it's minah shamayim. It's almost like it seems like it's from heaven. And outside the land of Israel, we're just not supposed to uh, recite this as often as they do in Israel. We in the Ashkenazic community only recite it on the Yom Tov. And that's when we have the Kohanim go up and bless us. Sephardim, Jews of a Sephardic background, they have a different tradition with this. And they do have Birchas Kohanim. Uh, even on a daily basis outside the land of Israel. And I've heard of great Jews who come visiting from Israel. And they are so used to having Birchas Kohanim, being blessed by Kohanim, they just can't imagine uh, having their day go right without that. And sometimes they'll make a point of davening in a Sephardic minion just so they can have Birchas Kohanim. They don't want to give that up. I've heard of great Ashkenazic rabbis who would visit from Israel, would make a point, make a habit of davening with a Sephardic minion for Shachras, or at least popping in at one, just so they don't miss out on Birchas Kohanim. Just to be aware. So there's a real difference in Ashkenazim and Sephardim outside the land of Israel with that. I want to share with you a fascinating halacha that applies to Birchas Kohanim, and then a contemporary application of it. So I'm scrolling down. This is in the Shulchan Aruch, in the section that's describing Birchas Kohanim, about how the Kohanim, how the our, our priests, as it's often translated, uh, but it basically means the male descendants of Aharon, how they would bless us with those uh, verses that we just read in the Chumash. So let's see what the Shulchan Aruch says. It's in section Orachayim, Kuf Chaf Ches, that's section 128, and it's Sif Lamed Hey 35. So here it is. Kohen Shahara Gesenefesh. If a Kohen killed another person, Afilu Bishogig, even if it was unintentional, Lo Yisa Es Kapav, he should not perform these, this, these blessings, he should not lift his hand to the Jewish people anymore. Afilu Asa Tshuva, even if he has repented, if, he, if this is a Kohen who has taken a life, he is disqualified from Duchening, as it's always referred to in Yiddish. He's disqualified from uh, conferring these blessings on Klal Yisrael. Haga, this is Rav Moshe Israelis' take. What, is, what does he say in the Ashkenazi communities? Yesh Orim, others say, Dim Asa Tshuva, that if the Kohen killed somebody, but then did Teshuva, he repented from what he had done. No say Kapab, he should bless everyone. Yesh Lahakala Bale Tshuva, and he says, whenever there's a dispute. We should always be lenient when it comes to those who are looking to repent. We never want to shut the door before someone who really wants to sincerely repent and return to God. And this is the custom because he says we want, want to make certain that we, don't, we do not shut the door on anybody who would like to uh, uh, be engaged in the tshuva process. That's what the Shulchan Aruch uh, writes, and that's what Ramosha Israelis comments. Okay, but what was the concern? Why did the Shulchan Aruch start by writing that there was a concern that a Kohen who killed someone shouldn't do him? So look how the Mishnah Brewer explains this, the next source on the bottom of the page. Afilu asa teshuva, even if this guy did teshuva, we, we, he says, the Shulchan Aruch had written, he still should not bless everyone, the Birchas Kohanim. Tam de azu, what's the reason behind this? The Svirale, he holds, even though there's nothing that stands in the way of teshuva, of repentance, Mikol Malkum, nonetheless, ain kateger nasasenegar, we have this principle that the prosecutor cannot become the defense attorney. Someone whose job it is to prosecute can't switch roles. So what does that mean here? To be a dayim elu, these hands, shahara gesanefesh, that played a role in killing, taking another life, ain roi lisa es kapav. It's just not fitting that those hands should be used to confer a blessing of Hashem on us, aval pisha even though he's done teshuva. So what is the Mishnah explaining? There's a machlokas. The Shulchan Aruch ruled stringently. The Shulchan Aruch ruled that if a coin killed another person, even if it was b'shogeg, even if it was unintentional, that's it. He's disqualified from conferring the blessings. He can't. He cannot participate in birchas kohanim. But then the Ramah says, no. If he's done teshuva, he could. What's what's this? The rationale behind the stringent position. 
Why would the Shulchan Aruch take the hard line and say, no, he cannot, he's disqualified from, from duchening, from, from blessing. What's that based on? This concept of ein kategor nasasenegor is that the one who is the prosecutor, the one who was out to get us can't switch roles and become the defense attorney. Meaning those hands that you want to use for birches kohanim, part of it is the kohanim lift their hands and they position their fingers in a specific way and they bless us. So how can those hands that played a role in taking life bless us with shalom? It's just, it's, it's an oxymoron. It's, it's just, it's a contradiction. It, it, it just can't, it can't be. So therefore he says, even if it was unintentional, even if the person did teshuva, those hands could no longer be used to bless us with shalom. That's what the Shulchan Aruch's position was, a stringent position. Again, the Ramah told us, of Moshe Yisrael has said, however, if the fellow has done teshuva, has repented, then we allow him to dochen again. But again, the Shulchan Aruch took the hard line there. And this is the reason behind it, because we look at those hands and we say, those just aren't a fitting vessel to confer God's blessing on B'nai Yisrael. This would have very practical applications nowadays. Uh, it would always have practical applications, but let's say a simple scenario. Let's say if someone was involved in a car accident and, and God forbid someone died. Now that driver, had it was a Cohen, let's say. He had no intentions on killing anybody. It was totally unintentional. And he may have done teshuva, spent years in repentance, begging the family for forgiveness, begging God for forgiveness, everything that could be done, making compensation, whatever could be done. But according to the Shulchan Aruch, the Rav Yosef Kara would tell that person if he was a Kohen, he can't dochen anymore. He can't participate in Berches Kohanim. But Rama would say if he's done teshuva, then he could because we don't want to shut the door before sincere um, people, so sincere penance, people who really, uh, uh, penitents, we, we never want to close the door on them. So it would have a very practical application. But I want to give you another application. We think of that as a car accident uh, here in America. You're thinking of a way that someone could take a life. Let me give you a very practical uh, application in Israel, where there are so many of our brothers and sisters who are serving in the army, Tzal, defending the Jewish people. And numerous, uh, many of those young men are Kohanim. What if those Kohanim were off at war in some kind of battle and they killed? And they dochen. That's what I want to share with you. Can they continue to confer the blessing? Berchas Kohanim on Klal Yisrael. So I want to share with you a beautiful response from Rabbi Avadji Yosef. So here's a brief bio on Rabbi Avadji Yosef. Rabbi Avadji Yosef was born in 1920 in Iraq, passed away in 1913. So he was about 93 years old when he died. He was a rabbi, Talmudic scholar, recognized halachic authority, he was the former Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel. Rabbi Yosef was also the spiritual leader of the Shas political party in the Israeli Knesset. Very uh, uh, recognizable in pictures uh, for, for dressing in the part of the traditional uh, robe and, and, uh, and headdress or turban, you might say, of the Sephardic Chacham. And uh, he was also very well known, recognizable, I should say, because of those glasses. He had very uh, weak eyes. Uh, they were very sensitive to light. So he wore those dark glasses and uh, you know they were photosensitive. So when he would go outside, they would turn even darker to protect his eyes from the light. I may have told you this in the past. I was privileged after high school to have actually met him and, and shaken his hand. I'll, I'll tell you briefly what happened. So <clears throat> the uh, academic year of 1992-93, I was learning at a yeshiva in Yerushalayim, in Yeshiva Chafetz Chaim, and it was in, it was in Jerusalem. And Rav Avadji Yosef at that point, he was living in Jerusalem. He was not yet in Harnof. I don't remember where the neighbor was. I believe it was Rechavia somewhere where he was living. And we had a, a fellow in yeshiva with us who was Persian. So he was of Sephardic origins, he felt, but he was Persian. He had, his family was originally from Iran. And obviously the time that he was in Israel, you have to remember Rabbi Vaji Yosef was revered in the Sephardic communities. Uh, he was a genius, he had a photographic memory and he, and he issued halakhic rulings that um, were of service to everybody in Klal Yisrael. So this fellow, uh, uh, his name was Shimon, who was in yeshiva with us was a, a Persian background. He comes back to the dorm one night and he says, he heard, I don't remember where he picked this up. Was it from family members, from friends, Sephardic friends in a different yeshiva? I don't remember where he got it from, but I heard that Rav Avadji Yosef is at home recovering from some medical procedure and his doctors do not want him going to shul for the next week. So for the next week, 
he's going to be having a minion in his house. So this is an opportunity. And here's this really famous rabbi that if you wanted to make an appointment and meet him and see him, you'd have to get in touch with his secretaries and try to pull all sorts of strings to get in. But now he's davening in his house for the next week and he davens shachris vasikin at the crack of dawn. So at daybreak is when he davens. So this is a crazy opportunity. We could go to Rav Avadji Yosef's house. We could daven with him at a private minion in his house, no appointments necessary. And it'll be, it won't be crowded because he davens so bright and early, who's gonna be up? So this is an incredible opportunity to meet uh, the great Chacham, Rav Avadji Yosef. So he got a couple of us interested and we said, yeah, you know, we're in Israel for the year. We're looking for experiences. This qualifies as an important experience, something that's like a once in a lifetime moment. We're in, we're gonna do it. So we, we, before we went to sleep that night, we placed our orders for a cab to meet us in front of yeshiva. You know, we timed it out how much time we would need to get there. And uh, probably about five of us, because we probably put three or four in the back seat, one in the front. So we, we took a cab to Rav Avadji Yosef's house. Shimon was the one, you know, leading the mission. He was the one who was most excited about this. And uh, we went to Daven there, and I, a couple things struck out in my memory. One was that I don't remember seeing any walls in his house. There was bookshelves everywhere. There was no walls. It was just bookshelves filled with sfarim. And every safer had um, uh, place markers in them, whether it was pieces of paper, post-it notes, bookmarks, whatever it was. It's, it, this, this library in Rav Avadji Yosef's house was not for show. Every single safer in there was used. And he ran out of room on the bookshelves. There were piles, stacks of svarim everywhere on the floor. He didn't have them directly on the floor. He had like a piece of wood or carved by stack of svarim on top of that. There were books everywhere. And we davened there, I remember in the house. And I remember looking around like, I don't see Rav Avadji Yosef anywhere. And then I realized what, what the problem was. In his own house, he wore, he didn't wear the robes and turban. In his own house, he was wearing a tie and a dark suit. In fact, it was a kapata, like, you know, what Lithuanian Russia yeshiva wear, like that long frock coat. So in his own house, we were davening chakras. He had his tals and fillet on. The only way I recognized him was because of those dark glasses, the sunglasses that he was wearing. That's how I knew it was Ravavaji Yosef, and he was sitting at his desk. But aside from that, he didn't have those colorful robes and the turban on. And we davened chakras. And at the end of the minyan, Everybody lined up to shake his hand before leaving to go about their day. And in Sparta custom, they kissed his hand before leaving. And so we're in line. And I just remember thinking to myself, oh man, I'm just not comfortable with that. That's not the way, that's not the way I do things. I, you know, I'm Ashkenazi, I'm just not used to kissing you know, hands of the rabbis, especially after 15 people in front of me just kissed his hand. <laughs> I wasn't about to do it. So so I uh, I one of his sons was standing at his side. So I shook his hand, and before it was time to kiss it. I just shook his head. I said, you know, Ani me America, uh, you know, Zelo Hamidag Shali. I was trying to say the best. That's not what I'm used to. And he was fine. There was no offense taken whatsoever. And uh, I, I asked if I could take a picture uh, together, you know, with the, with the great rabbi. And it was his son who told me, he says, yes, just make sure to turn off your flash, you know, because he's got very sensitive eyes. So remember, those are the days, those 35 millimeter cameras. You can easily flick the switch, turn off your flash. Did that, and I have a, a picture of, of shaking Rav Avadji's hand uh, of that that morning. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's something I treasure. It's not all that often you come into contact, close contact with historic figures, and it was a it was a great moment of of that year spent in Israel. Be that as it may, I want to share with you. He wrote volumes. Rav Avadji Yosef was a prolific author. He had a photographic memory, as I said. People turned to him from around the world for halachic questions. And I found in one of his halachic works called Yechav Adas, where he addresses the question. Someone had written to him, a soldier uh, serving in the Israeli army, um, wrote that this fellow had killed people. He had killed enemies of the Jewish people. And he wanted to know, was he disqualified from Birchas Kohanim at this point moving forward? So he wrote a long response to this. But I just want to share with you the end of it. And it's, it's beautiful, it's touching. Let's, let's read it together. He says, Ve'emes, in truth, Shabinidon Shalanu, in this case of the soldier who killed, he said, I had a, he had a very long discussion why he thinks it would be okay. But he goes, well, let's cut to the chase. That's not necessary. Aside from what the Prichadash wrote, Sheim Anasu Laharog. So the Prichadash was a, an Akron who wrote that if, let's say, someone was forced to kill, he didn't kill on their own volition. 
on his own volition. Let's say someone forced him to kill. However, you could imagine that scenario. No se kapav. Such a person could still dochen, could still uh, um, uh, uh, recite the berchas koanim. This kimimo b'sefer bis b'sefer bis menucha. Others agree with him. Vimkain, if that's the case, harei akoin shomei mult savas ha'oyev. Any soldier who was drafted into an army, he didn't kill on his own volition. He was drafted into an army. He was under orders to, to go out and engage in combat. He's, he's been put in the army. He's put into a, um, a situation of harm. There's no greater situation of anus being compelled to kill than this. Because we say, that if, if someone's trying to kill you, Judaism says, don't let yourself be a victim, kill first. So here's a person who is compelled to kill. This is not, this is, this is, this is a case of honest. If the, if the status is out there, if the law is out there, that if something was honest, is compelled, didn't kill on their own volition, but someone compelled them to do so, they can still engage in birchas kohanim. This is the ultimate case of honor. Someone who was uh, drafted into the military, put in a set of circumstances where there are others trying to kill him, he has to kill them. So that's that's being compelled, and therefore that person could still do him. He could still engage in birchas kohanim. That that's he says that that should and I saw of Moshe Feinstein writes this also. So he says that should be the, the simplest way to end this. But now he goes as follows: Vidinza Adif. But our case, where we're talking about a soldier in Sahal, it's even more powerful than that case. Dinza Adif Harbe Medina Pri Khadash. Our case is more strong than the case of the Pri Khadash. We was talking about serving in a foreign army. Sharia filu imon sarogis chavero yisrael yaragal yavor. In the in the pre Chadash's case, we were talking about let's say someone forced him to kill another member of the Jewish people, which is a case of Yarog Val Yavor that he's not supposed to uh, he's not supposed to do this because we would say as he quotes the Gemara, my chazis dama didan sarotfei. Why is my blood more red than the other person's blood? So he says, and we know that this is in the this is clear in Allah. So it goes in the case of the pre Chadash. Even if this guy was compelled, forced to kill another Jew, which was wrong, he should not have done that. That person could still dochen because he was compelled. Even though he killed another Jew, which he should not have done, he says that he, he could still dochen because he didn't do it on his own volition. Even she'anusu because he was compelled. He didn't do it on his own from his own free will. Aval pisha even though he acted incorrectly. So Kol Shekin Khan. So certainly here, Shakonim Him Chayalit Sahal. We're talking about soldiers who they were soldiers of Tzvahagan Ali Yisrael, the Israeli Defense Forces. Om Dim Lenogain Ali Yisrael. Their job is to protect the members of the Jewish people. Bal Artseno Akadosha in our holy land. She'ain Safik, there is no doubt. Shemitzvah Rabba Himosim. They are engaged in a great mitzvah. To go out in the front of the armies, and to lay waste, do whatever they can to decimate our enemies who are trying to indiscriminately kill men, women, and children. Just think what was going on in the last couple of weeks. Them firing their missiles indiscriminately into miss into cities, population centers, not at the military targets, at population centers, trying to kill as many men, women, and children as they can, those murderers from Hamas. So he says a Jew who serves in the Israeli army and is going out to defeat them and to protect lives, what greater mitzvah could there possibly be? This is what the Rambam ruled. That if a Jew plays a role in protecting the Jewish community from the enemies that are coming to conquer them, he bechlal melchemes mitzvah. That's the greatest type of war out there. It's called melchemes mitzvah. To engage in such type of war, that's melchemes mitzvah. Vim Cain, if that's the case, bevaday she'ein suffik she'kohanim elak sherem lenesius kapayim. So then certainly such a coin who is engaged in a melchemes mitzvah could certainly uh, confer blessings on the Jewish people and engage in in uh, in the Berchas uh, Kohanim. After the parentheses, so he says as follows. So he says, um, let, let me go as far as he goes. Va'amnam he'erichu achronim b'tshuvasayim. So he says, when you look at all the later halakhic authorities who were dealing with the question of soldiers serving in war, Bedin chayolim kohanim. They were dealing with kohen soldiers. Shechazrim emarachas who returned home from engaged in combat. 
im kesherim heim unasis kaim. And they wanted to know, could they uh, be involved with birchas kohanim or not? Because they know that they engaged in combat with the enemy's army and they fought and they killed. So they were talking about Jews who were forced to serve in the Tsar's army, Jews who were forced to serve in the in the French Foreign Legion, whatever it could have been. And the whole question was that maybe in the course of being forced to fight the foreign army, they could have fought off, they could have done battle with their fellow Jews who were drafted into the enemy's army. So here is this one guy named Yankel Cohen who was serving in the Tsar's army and the Tsar forced him to go to war against Poland and he may have killed Shmero, another Jew who was serving in the Polish army. That's what was being dealt with until now in our history. And they all ruled that since they were compelled, that was called Anus, they were still kosher, they were still allowed to engage in Birchas Kohanim. Avokan, the Mohammed's Magen Zu, but now what are we dealing with? We're not dealing with that scenario. He says, if we're dealing with here, Jews who were engaged in combat to defend Am Yisrael, the Jewish people. They put their lives in their hands to march out and to meet the enemy before the enemy would destroy Jewish people. To save Jewish lives. Adaraba, to the contrary, not only should this person not be disqualified from duchening and from blessing us with Birchas Kohanim, I want such a person. I want those hands to bless me. In other words, the Mishnah Bruit said, what was the logic behind when the Shulchan Aruch said that what a coin who kills shouldn't duchen? Because those hands, in Kategor and Asasenegor, those hands that have been the prosecutor can't be the defense attorney, meaning hands that engaged in taking life can't confer shalom. But in this scenario, those hands that took life, why did they take life? They were engaged in the incredible mitzvah of Hatzalos Nefashos Yisrael, trying to save Jewish lives, children, men, women, children. Then what greater mitzvah could there possibly be? Not only is it okay for those hands to engage in Birchas Kohanim, what better hands could there be to engage in Birchas Kohanim? What a beautiful tshuva he's saying here. Adaraba, to the contrary, Roy Lomar Lam, you should tell such a Kohen, Techazkena Yedem, strengthen your hands, the Yasher Kocham, slap him a big Yasher Koach and say, I want those hands blessing me. Hands which engaged in such mitzvahs, what better hands could there be? Badover Borer, this is so clear, Lelot Sel shall suffer without a shadow of a doubt. Shekesherim vehagunim him when he kapayim. That is such, such soldiers who are serving in the Israeli army in defense of Kal Yisrael are certainly fitting and kosher to engage in Birchas Koharim, the Avarchumi Pialyod. And they will bless us, and, they're, they're, and, and God's blessing will come through them. The Kuyam al Yadam, and through them will be fulfilled. That God says, I want you to place my name on the Jewish people and through you, I will bless them. So that's a, such a beautiful tshuva from Rav Avadji Yosef here about, about, uh, about the, the value. Uh, and you can just imagine the morale boost this must have been because we all know Kohanim. And I, I'm telling you, I think we've all experienced this about Kohanim. There's a pride that a Kohen feels in their yichus, in their lineage that they're a descendant of Aaron Akoin. And while the rest of us, we have no idea what our Jewish lineage is, we know we're Jewish, but we don't know what tribe we're a part of. They know they're not only what tribe, they know they're from Shevet Levi, but they also know they're direct descendants of Aaron Akoin. They wear that with such a badge of pride. To now tell such a Kohen that something that made you unique, you can't do anymore. You can't do it. You can't be engaged in Birchaz Kohanim. That's heartbreaking. And now Rabbi Vajay is saying to them, not only can you be involved in Birchas Kohanim, but it's not a bit of yevet, it's l'charchila. It's, it's so appropriate that you should be blessing Klal Yisrael. Those hands that serve to save Klal Yisrael, I want those hands blessing us. They were engaged in such mitzvahs, I want them blessing us. You could just imagine what kind of a morale boost that must have been. I, I, I think that's a beautiful tshuva. It's a beautiful response from Rabbi Vajay Yosef, and it sheds a lot of light into the feelings that we should have and the sense of hakara satov we should have, appreciation we should have of people who, who put upon themselves that responsibility of defending and saving our brothers and sisters, Achenu Bnei Yisrael, all of, all of our people who are in harm's way. 
because there certainly are enemies out there who want to lay waste and destruction to all of Klal Yisrael. And we just saw this within a couple of weeks. It's a refresher. It's a terrible refresher that there are enemies that are out there that want to destroy man, woman, child, everybody that they could get their uh, their, get their rockets to reach. Okay. I want to share, let's move on to Bahaloscha. I want to share with you something I saw this week that I thought was a beautiful shot, a beautiful explanation, which helps me better make sense of some psukim that, that uh, never fully sat well with me before. So this is in chapter 11, Parak Yud Aleph. So this is the, the B'nai Yisrael has been receiving man. They've been receiving that mana from heaven, that heavenly uh, sustenance that's been falling every day from Shemayim. And that's what they're eating. That's what's providing them nutrition while they're in the Midbar. And we're going to find in this week's Parsha, Baaloscha, the first of the misononim, the complaints that start to come in. People start saying, oh, vey, we miss all that good food we had back in Egypt. Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> even though this was heavenly food, it still didn't uh, satisfy all of their desires, all of their needs, and people start complaining. So let's see what happens here. So Hashem speaks to Moshe and says, okay, these guys are complaining that they want meat. I'll give them some meat. So let's see, Yudchas, 18. Tomar. So God says to Moshe, Hashem says to Moshe, tell B'nai Yisrael, he's got Shulamachar. Tomorrow, prepare yourselves. Basar. Tomorrow, I'll see to it that you will eat meat. Because you've been crying into the ears of God, saying, Mi Achilenu Basar. Oy, we miss all this meat. We want to have meat. He told Vlan in Mitzrayim, we had it better off in Mitzrayim where we had access to Basar, access to meat. God will certainly give you plenty of meat to eat. Yud test 19. You're not just going to eat for one day or two days. Not five days. Not 10 days. Not 20 days. 20. I will see to it that you'll have enough meat starting tomorrow that you'll be able to go a month straight. You'll just, we'll just be fleshic for a month straight, just eating meat. You're going to be so sick of meat, it's going to be coming out of your nose. And it's going to nauseate you. Why is this going to happen to you? Because you've despised the Lord. And you cried in front of him, Lamar, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? We had it so good there. We had all that meat, and now we're out in the wilderness. So what a disgusting complaint after all I've done for you and I saved you from Egypt and I split the siege around the Egyptian army, gave you riches, been feeding you, and now you're complaining you had it better in Egypt, but a chutzpah. You want meat? I'll give you meat till it's coming out of your nose. You're going to be so sick of it. Tough olive, 21. Vayomer Moshe. So Moshe turns to Hashem and he says, Sheish meos elef ragliyam, asher nochi bekirbo. God, wait a second. There are 600,000 people on foot in whose midst I'm with. Now, it's, it's really more than that. 600,000 is just the adult men between 20 to 60. Once you factor in the children and the women and the elderly, so the estimates are between two to three million people. So we got this huge nation here. Vata Marta, and you're telling me, Basar Atenlam Vaachlu Chodeshamim, you've got enough meat that you're going to give a crowd this large that they're going to have meat for 30 days. Hatsona Bakari Shachetlam. Even if they were to shecht every one of the sheep and cattle that they have, uh, in cold, as and even if you would gather for them all the fish that are in the sea, could there be enough? Would it suffice for them? Come on, you know, you've got this huge crowd. What are you talking about for a month straight? How's that going to happen? Of Gimel 23, Hashem says to Moshe, Ayad Hashem Tikzar, is my power limited? is that now you're going to see if my word comes true for you or not. A plain reading of the text makes it sound like Moshe doubted Hashem's ability. A plain reading, Pashup Shat, makes it sound like Hashem just told them, I'm going to give them enough meat that they'll eat it for a month straight. It's going to be cousin out of their nose. They'll be so sick of it. And Moshe says, God, what are you talking about? Don't you realize the numbers here? You got this wild amount of people how are you going to come up with enough meat to give them for a month straight? Come on. And finally, Hashem says, don't, what are you saying? I'm not capable? Just hang on and you'll see if my words come true or not. So that, that looks like what happened there. And that's very puzzling because then it comes out that Moshe is doubting Hashem. Moshe hasn't seen enough already to know that God is perfectly capable. 
creates a world, he could probably give people a, a, a massive nation meat for a month. He split the sea, he could do that. He did the 10 plagues in Egypt, he could do this. What, what is, where does Moshe come off at a, from a plain reading doubting Hashem? So Rashi here quotes a medrash that says this actually was a conversation between two of our sages. The first sage, I think it was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva did understand the Pesukim literally. And now let's see what Rabbi Shimon objects. So in Rashi there says, Rabbi Shimon, Omer, Rabbi Shimon says, Chas v'shalom. How could you read that literally, Rabbi Akiva? That can't possibly be what this righteous man Moshe was thinking. Misha Kosovo, this is the same Moshe that we're going to read about next week. I'm sorry, the end of this week's Parsha, after an incident when Miriam and Aaron speak Lashon Haran, and that's when there's so much in this Parsha. So we're going to read about Moshe, that God testifies about Moshe, that he is trusted in my entire house, meaning he, Hashem said, me and Moshe are like this, we've got such a close relationship. Do you really think someone who Hashem says is my confidant, he's my trusted friend, do you really think he would be in doubt about God's abilities to provide meat? Ella, so how do we understand these psukim? What's Moshe saying? So Rav Shimon says, Ella kachomer. This is what Moshe was saying. Sheish meyo salaf ragli. You have 600,000 adult men. Again, factor in all the kids, women, and elderly. You got two to three million people. Marta, and you're telling me, Basar etain l'chod shamim, you're going to give them meat for a month? Va'achar kach taharo guma gadol azu? And after giving them, I have no doubt, God, that you could give them all that meat for a month. But after doing that, showering on them, all of that stuff, now you're just going to wipe them out? Does that make sense, God, that you're going to give them so much meat and a full month's worth of fressing on all that meat, and after all that, you're going to kill them? And that food that they eat for a month, that's going to be basically their last meal? Does that reflect well for you, God? Omrim Lo, does anyone say to their chamor, to their donkey, tol kor sa'orem v'nachtok roshcha, let me feed you a core that was a big volume of barley, and then I'm going to chop your head off? No one does that. It's like, it's just something is bizarre about that. You don't have someone totally fresh and totally eat out, uh, eat up a storm like that, and then, and then now, and now say, uh, and now say, uh, that you're going to put them to death? That doesn't make sense. That's not the way people behave. That's not normal behavior. So what does God answer Moshe? He tells Moshe, you're right. It's bizarre behavior to feed them for a month and then kill them. But what, what's my options? If I don't give them the meat, if I don't give them the meat, they're going to say, oh, it must be God's not capable. Would you rather that the hand of God should look like it's lacking in their eyes? Let them perish and a hundred more like them. And don't let any human being ever think for a second that my powers are limited. So that's how Rav Shimon tells Rabbi Akiva, that's how to understand these psukim. It's not that Moshe was doubting God's ability. Moshe would never doubt God's ability to provide, to provide uh, um, all of this. Rather, what was happening was as follows. Moshe says, I know you could do this. I know you could, you could give them enough meat to eat for a week. But then what? Then you're going to kill them right after that? That's like bizarre behavior. You're saying, knock yourself out, enjoy, and then knock them out. It's going to reflect poorly on you, God. So Hashem says back, yeah, I know, but what's my other option? Uh, my other option is, is that people are going to say I'm not capable. And then it's a chilol Hashem. So rather, I'd, I'll, I'll act in this bizarre fashion about feeding them meat for a month, let them gorge themselves on meat, and then kill them. That's what I'm going to do, rather than have anyone say my powers are limited. That's how Rashi quotes this, uh, this uh, teaching of Shimon. Rav Shimon did not like a literal reading, because if you read it literally, it comes out that Moshe doubted Hashem's abilities, which sounds very strange. So this is how he sets up the conversation. But this week, I saw that that's the Kenway Balitosos, he has a, a, a different way to read this that I would say might be more, might be more shot oriented, might be more oriented towards a plain reading of the text. And it's a different way. It's a fascinating approach. And you'll see how this ties back to the Kohanim. We started off talking about Kohanim this morning, and then we're going to come full circle. We're going to come back to them. So let's look at the Dasakanim. So he wants to understand what's the conversation. So he says, he first give one way. Now here's the second way to understand the conversation. 
What was Moshe asking when he says, can you possibly have enough meat for them? Here's what Moshe was asking. Moshe certainly knows Moshe certainly knows that the creator of the cosmos has the ability to provide them with enough meat. He never doubted that for a second. Here was Moshe's hang up. Okay, let's define a term here. Basar taiva means meat that I have a desire for. The whole time that the Jewish people lived in the wilderness, if, if someone wanted to eat a hamburger, you know what they had to do? They had to shech the animal, bring part of it as a carbon in the Mishkan, and then they could go home with the rest of it. It was the whole time they were in the Mish, in the Midbar, rather, in the wilderness, what was called basar taiva, meat of desire. The Nei Yisrael, the Jewish people could only eat desired meat if they also brought some as a carbon. But they, nowadays, what we're used to, yeah, just go to the, bring your cow to the shochet, it'll shecht it for you, it'll slaughter it, and now go home and make steak and hamburger. That, that option was not so available in the Midbar. You had to go bring it to the Mishkan, bring some of it as a carbon, and then you got to go home with some. What's the problem? So let's see what the Dasakim says. Second line, here's what Moshe says. In this period of time in the wilderness, you forbade the Jewish people from eating uh, meat of desire, Unless they bring it as a korban, give some to the kohanim, and then they can have some to take home. At this point in history, there are only three kohanim. Aaron, and then he's got his two remaining sons. Because remember, he had Nadav and Aviu, and then he had Elazar and Yisamar. He had four sons. Nadav and Aviu died, so it's just Aaron, and then it's uh, Elazar and Yisamar. He's got, there's three kohanim in the whole Jewish people now. So if you're telling me the law is basar taiva, meat of desire, requires everybody to go bring a korban, and you're telling me everyone who complained now uh, is going to have meat to eat for a, a month, do you realize what you're saying, Hashem? You're saying, I have no doubt you could make them, uh, you know, a whole herd of sheep and, and cows just happen to wander upon us now, and there will be enough meat. But if, if you don't change the laws, we got a problem. There's only three Kohanim. If they got to bring, to eat a month's worth of meat, that means they have to bring tons of Korbanos to the Mishkan. And there's only three Kohanim who are there. So let's see what he says. What's the problem? Everyone who brings a Karban, the Kohanim are going to be overwhelmed. The, what happens when there's a Karban? Some gets burnt on the Mizbech, but then the Kohanim have to eat a, a whole chunk. But the Kohanim are going to be overwhelmed. They can't keep up with the demand. There's only three Kohanim. How much meat could they eat? And then what's going to be, if they don't eat it in the proper time, it's going to be called Nosar, which is leftovers, which has to be incinerated. And we generally do everything we can to prevent Nosar. They won't be able to process all this. So the supply chain is going to be messed up. Hashem, it can't be done. What does it mean it can't be done? I don't doubt your abilities to give them enough meat, but the process that you, you, you our hands are tied. The only way we can eat Basar Taiva is if we bring it as a carbon, but there's only three Kohanim who can eat meat. They can't eat enough to make a whole nation eat meat for a month. So what does Hashem say? And so Moshe continues and says, Imes kol Benichusa. Moshe is saying, I could hear if you wanted to offer them fish. If you wanted to cause a tsunami to occur and now a hurricane blows in a storm of fish, okay, that I could hear, Klomar. If they had asked for fish, and you wanted to come up with a miraculous way to give them fish, Nicha, that could be fine. There's no concept of if you want to eat fish, you got to bring some of it as a carbon. But now you're saying you're going to give them enough meat for a month. Shamarta says, the mashma mitzona bakar. Basar means it's coming from either cattle or sheep. Kasha, I got a real problem. They got to bring the carbon. We don't have enough kohanim to eat all that meat. How are they going to have a month's worth of meat for all of Israel? So what's Hashem's answer? Do you really think, Moshe, that my hands are limited? Atatira, you're going to see how I'm going to pull it off. What does that mean? I'm sorry. I will give them basar. I'll give them a type of meat, the loyit starklu karban, that does not need to be brought as a karban to the Kohanim. And what is that? 
Vizawaslav. That's the quail. Shame Mavi and Mimeno Karban. A slav is never brought on the Mizbeach. What does Basar Taiva mean? Anything that could be brought on the Mizbeach, the time we were in the Midbar, in the wilderness, we were not allowed to eat Basar Taiva, desired meat, unless we also brought it as a carbon and shared it with the Kohanim. But if I want to eat something that has the status of Basar that never goes on the Mizbeach, then it's not limited to those laws of, of Basar Taiva. It doesn't have to go to, uh, to, to be brought as a carbon and to, uh, and to the... Uh, and to the uh, Kohen. So therefore Hashem is saying, uh, uh, you really think I'm limited? Just wait and see how I can pull it off. It's like the ultimate riddle. How can I provide Klai Yisrael with a month's worth of meat and not run into a Basar Taiva situation? So Moshe stumped. God, I don't know how you're gonna do it. Hashem says, just watch. What did he do? Slav, brought quail. Why? Because there's no din of Basar Taiva when it comes to quail, because that's not an animal, that's not a bird, rather, that's supposed to be brought as a carbon. Therefore, all the halachas of Basar Taiva don't apply to it. So it's a very different way of, of learning this conversation between Moshe and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I, I, I found this to be uh, so uh, such a novel reading, a very creative reading, but it's also an enjoyable reading of these psukim, one that I had never seen before, that that uh, that uh, really resonated with me. But I, look how this all circles back because it comes back to the Kohanim. We started off this morning learning about Birchas Kohanim, the special brachas, the special blessings that the Kohanim would confer upon B'nai Yisrael. We saw something about them. We saw this halacha about someone who kills, even if it's accidentally, it's very complicated if they could do it. Rabbi Vaj is saying this certainly does not apply to a member of the Israeli Defense Forces because they were performing the greatest mitzvah. And not only is it okay for such a person to do it, I want such a person to do it. I want that person's bracha, hands that were involved in such a mitzvah. And then we come back to this Das Zikanim at the end, telling us about this, this cryptic conversation between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu. What was Moshe so caught up about? So the Das Zikanim says he never was confused that Hashem can't find a way to come up with all this meat. What he was caught up upon is it's a riddle. How are they going to have this meat and not run into the problem of Basar Taiva that they got to bring it as a korban? To which Hashem says, just watch, I got a way to pull it off introduces him to the slum, but I think with the quail, but I think what we have to remember this is that message at that, Hayat Hashem Tiktar. We have to remember Hashem's hands lack nothing. Oftentimes we find ourselves in situations where we're frustrated and we think to ourselves, how can this situation possibly change? I can't think of any way out of this situation. I'm frustrated. I can't think of any way out of this situation. And then Hashem somehow has a way of solving problems and making those problems go away, coming up with a novel way to, to solve, correct the situation, solve a problem that we never could have imagined on our own. We didn't see it coming and boom, it's there. That's what HaKadosh Baruch is capable of. Hayat Hashem Tiktsar. None of us should ever fall into a state of despair. Even if we find ourselves fretting, we should always remember Yeshua Hashem Kaharif Ayin is that Hashem's salvation could come in the blink of an eye. Hayat Hashem Tiktsar. It's not short. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has no problem coming up with solutions. Even though we can't think of them, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is more than capable. And this should give us chizak. This should give us the encouragement we need to deal with some of the challenging situations we find ourselves facing throughout the course of our lives. So I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody for joining. And uh, I want to go to the stop share, but my computer is not letting me do that right now because I want to unmute everyone. My computer seems to have frozen. Oh boy. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's still recording. Hang on. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it's going to. Uh... Rabbi. Oh, good. If you're able to unmute yourself, feel free to unmute. Yeah. I don't know why I can't get off of the stop share. Oh, oh, that was beautiful. Was... Very interesting. Oh, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm so glad you joined them. And... I enjoyed it tremendously. Oh, you got it. Thank you, Rabbi. Can I ask a question? Why was David not allowed to build a base on Ekdash? Oh, I'm sorry. I, okay. I, I, I lost Forget you for it. a second. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I lost okay. you for a second. 